Welcome to Season 2 of the Inspectations Podcast, hosted by Justin Starbird, CEO of the Abley Group. In business, as in life, one of the most difficult tasks a leader must do is find a way to manage expectations. Create expectations that are too high, and you will be constantly looked at as a failure. Create expectations that are too low, and your leadership will be questioned at every turn. Being able to inspect what you expect helps keep great teams pulling in the same direction and allows for pivots in real time. The Inspectations podcast brings together business leaders from all industries to talk about best practices, innovation, leadership, and business development. You're listening to the Inspectations podcast. Here's your host, Justin Starberg. Welcome back to the Inspectations podcast powered by the Able Group. My name is Justin Starberg, and today I get to welcome a you know, new friend, new guest, Rick Elmore, founder and CEO of Simply Noted. Rick, hey, great to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here, Justin. Uh, kind of neat how we met. We met through a client of mine, and and you know you you um, do a lot of different podcasts. So it got an outreach from you, and really neat story uh, to hear from you know and hear about today. So I'm I'm really looking forward to having you on. Excited to tell it. Happy to get started. Yeah. So Rick, um, you, uh, you know, founded Simply Noted uh, a, a couple of years ago, 2017. Tell me, what what do you guys do? Yeah. So Simply Noted at its roots is a handwritten notes platform. Um, you know, it's starting back in 2017, that was the idea. It's blossomed into so much more like most businesses do. But it was founded on the idea of helping businesses integrate, automate, and scale sending genuine handwritten notes. Um, it started during my time uh, doing my MBA. I was doing a full time like evening MBA class when I had a marketing professor. I was going through all the success rates in marketing about a year into my program. It's so going like through email, direct mail, cold calling, knocking doors, you know, social, all that stuff. Everything was super marginal, like four percent, eight percent, sixteen percent. Nothing was super exciting. And then after this like three hour lecture, I don't know if he was just being funny, but he said something that was just so like profound to me. And it was so obvious is that handwritten notes have a 99% open rate. And he's like, you know, guys, they're rare. No one's doing it anymore. And it's just a really great way to stick out amongst the crowd. And I just thought that was so powerful. So um, a classmate of mine and myself, we got together and started just like tinkering with the idea of like, how can we scale this? Like if we can help businesses scale and automate it, there may be something here. And then kept running with it. Uh, I started testing it. The results were amazing. Um, my doctors are like calling me back. So surprised that they were receiving handwritten notes. I just had to keep running with it. So since then, our platform's grown tremendously. Um, we've built our own technology. We're the only company in the world that's built its own purposely built handwriting robot. We have six pending patents on it. We have 400,000 people coming to our website organically every single month. Um, you know, we're, we're hitting the Inc. 5000 this year. We have 11 full-time employees, 22 if you're including contractors. I mean, it's just blossomed and become you know such a cool, cool business. And I'm really proud of it. Yeah, man, that is uh, that is really exciting to hear. Yeah, so I'm curious. Going back, you know, did you initially apply it to a business that you're already part of, or did you say, "Hey, you know, we think we could write notes better than you, or we want to write notes for you"? How did, how did that whole thing start before you created the platform? Well, I was in, I was in corporate America before this. Um, you know, before that, I was in the NFL. I was an athlete. Um, played sports my whole entire life. And when I got done, I, you know, I had to do something and that's why I jumped into the corporate world. But after about six years, um, I was having tons of success. You know, I just I had an itch I couldn't scratch. Um, so obviously, you know, this was something I was researching and developing while I was still there. But um, we really didn't like start doing any revenue or building the business until I was completely gone uh, from my corporate job. But absolutely, you know, I was testing it, sending it out to my doctors. Um, I had about a list of about 500 doctors that I didn't work with. I had a pretty large territory, Arizona, Nevada, um, and New Mexico. And I would send them out and just try to book meetings with them. And I, uh, I had a quota of about $50,000 a month. And from the, those first 500 test handwritten notes, I uh, sold $280,000 in new business in about six weeks. My whole business or my whole team was going nuts. My VP sales was going nuts. We're like, what are you doing? We all have to do this. And that was when like the entrepreneurial seizure moment happened. And that's when I started, <laughs> you know, making my transition from the corporate world to the, the entrepreneurial world. Um, right. Hasn't been easy. <laughs> Right, right. It's been a, a fun journey to say the least. When when is it easy, right? I mean, that's what's never. Wild about it. 
<laughs> ever doesn't matter if it's first year you're one of your five like i think a lot of entrepreneurs are type a it's like you're, you're just going to go after it and get it and it does like for me it doesn't matter if i'm a million dollar company five million dollar company or 10 million like i want to figure out a ways to grow it's just like what's in me you know i need to keep building sure. and growing and um something i was told recently by one of my mentors is like if your dream isn't big enough to you know, make the dreams of those who are coming with you come true as well. Like your dream's not big enough. So, um, you know, it used to be like, I just want to build a couple million dollar company, you know, if it was like, that's not going to help everybody. Like I want to scale this and grow this and make sure those who've helped me along the way, you know, when that exit happens, it's going to take care of them as well. I, I know you've answered this before, but when did you go from personally handwriting it and your team handwriting notes to then being like, uh, oh, damn, you know, we got to we, we have to find a way to do this better and larger. Well, we've always used robots. I never my my mind is we had to use tech. We had to use technology. Yeah. We cannot use people. People are it's unreliable. It's unscalable. A quality control nightmare. Um, it's expensive. It's slow. And I'm a tech guy. I've always been in, in, interested in tech, cameras, computers, drones, software, automation. And this was my opportunity to sink my teeth into how to make a business around robotics and, and digital software. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, uh, you started off by talking about uh, the the new platform that you have that's got, you know, six pending patents. Um, you are the only one that has a dedicated, you know, robot that's actually creating this. Tell me, how did you get to that stage, um, you know, versus the stuff off the shelf that you found to be, you know, less than uh, high quality? Well, we I we. I never, when I started this company, I never wanted to build my own robot. We were forced to, um, I tried <laughs> everything out there. Um, we started with a pen plotter, which is basically like a little drawing machine it's been around since the eighties. And then there's like a machine that the president uses. We went to that, um, I, from the best of my knowledge, or at least the company told me we are the largest pedestrian user, um, like private user, because they like, it's used a lot in politics, but the technology was built in the early nineties, I think 91 um a lot of scaling issues a lot of handwriting engine issues the handwriting engine is what drives the machine a lot of patterns it wrote like a robot um maybe you know six out of ten people or five out of ten people wouldn't notice it but you know we are trying to work with like fortune 100 companies like big organizations and really pitch the idea of sending a genuine handwritten note and looking back at these technologies that have been around for a while um I, I, they just, they look like they were written by robots. They have patterns. Um, they have not that much variation. The handwriting engine is not intuitive. Um, it's it literally just creates patterns. I'll place an A here. It'll place an A here. Like it, it it's not. So as our conversations got bigger, um, and I also knew is how you win business is how you lose business. Like if there's other people doing this, um, I had to have a way to compete that wasn't on price. So um, I said, you know what, screw it. Like, I'm going to build my own handwriting robot. Like, this is the only way to scale this business and be a clear leader in this space is to have something that is truly unique and different and better. Um, and I always tell our clients, if you want to send, you know, a handwritten note that looks like a handwritten note, like you work with Simply Noted. Like, if you're just looking for like the cheapest thing out there that, yeah, sure, there are some other clients out there um, that will do something in pen, but it's going to look like a robot did it but yeah very proud of it um had no clue what i was doing my background's in sports and athletic sales and marketing um really just got to work you know when you have problems you just start asking questions i mean i went to 14 different engineering firms in arizona i went through a phase zero which is basically just the development phase yep. and i would ask them i would show them our business this is what i'm trying to do this is the technologies that are available um we need to build something that's better and when i mean better this is what i mean it's better you know more scalable, higher capacities. It writes faster, um, its own handwriting engine, and basically would take phase zero from company number one, take the logo off and all their pricing out, and I would take it to a different engineering company and have them go through that whole process and basically say, hey, pick this apart. What do you like? What don't you like? How would you do it better? And I literally did that with 14 different companies. Um, I believed we spent like around two hundred thousand dollars just on opinions because I knew this was going to be a right. big project. Yeah, I mean, literally, That's because wild. you measure you measure ten. Yeah, yeah, you measure ten times, cut once, right? Like I knew this was going to be a big, big, big project. So, finally, found somebody that we are comfortable with. 
um, about a year and a half of development, <laughs> lots of sleepless nights, a lot of me long meetings, you know, go to work, go meet with the engineers at five, don't get done until like 10. <laughs> yeah, so I, man, yeah, I, so I, yeah, all right. I, you know, I understand a lot of this because a lot of our clients are in the uh, medical device, medical um, mm -hmm. space. So, you know, similar requirements, you got to go through all these iterations, but uh, they tend to be, you know, relatively established companies. So they have a R and D team that's out mm -hmm. working on this. Yeah. And then they have a sales team selling their existing, you know, devices. How the hell did you make money? Like, did you, were you still my out background selling? In sales? And that's, and that's the only reason this has worked is um, I, I owe, sorry, if you can hear, I have uh, some maintenance guys outside doing some work. Um, my background in sales and marketing and athletics is the only reason that this has worked. Um, and then I'm telling you, I, in the last five years, I've probably put more stress and more time than most people do in a 50 year career because I manage our SEO, our ads, our product development, our engineers, our web developers, our web designers, our team, our production. I, I manage all these guys. I'm working seven days a week. Um, but I love every second of it. It's making me better as a professional, as a person. It's making me learn how to think more conceptually, big picture, how to deal with stress, how to compartmentalize issues, put, put them in buckets, put all your marketing problems in a marketing bucket, all your sales problems in a sales bucket, production, development, product, robotics, software, and you write all these problems down and you deal with them independently. So it's really allowed me to grow as a professional, as a person. But I owe everything literally to my athletic background, sales and marketing. Um, it's really allowed me to develop the skills to launch a successful company. But um, we've never taken loans. We've never taken in any investors. We've never been in debt. Um, we've only spent money when we had the money. So yeah. like, think about it. Like, If you had to spend 100 grand one month, like you had to figure out a way to get it. So i um, incredibly proud of that. I mean, I started this company on $10,000, 0% interest credit card, like from Chase Bank. <laughs> yeah. Fast forward, you know, we've done millions <laughs> in revenue. So um, I would just have a sensational amount of drive, sensational amount of competitive spirit. Um, you know, no matter how bad the day is, I, I literally wake up excited to solve the problems I was dealing with yesterday. And I don't know why. I think that just happens to be because of my background. Um, yeah. You know, I had to deal with failure a lot, you know, growing up playing, you know, the sports at the level I was playing. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I and also you must have had great partnerships with your clients that you did have to kind of help also they see the vision that you had and said, all right, well, hey, we we want uh, what you have today because we're also going to get what you are producing for tomorrow. Is that accurate? That's that is ac very accurate. I was very lucky, you know, simply noted was, you know, I, I explained corporate as like this big cruise ship. You have hundreds of people. You have all this money coming <laughs> in. You have this big team that helps, you know this big, strong, sturdy ship go down the you know Pacific ocean. And then simply noted was this dinghy, you know, that had to figure out a, a way to be a speedboat to keep up with those, those uh, big cruise ships. We've been very lucky. Um, but I think luck comes from activity and hard work. Like you create your own luck, but luck plays a big part in it. Um, we have hooked some big cruise ships and some big companies <laughs> that helped fin. <laughs> very lucky. Like, I'm not going to lie, but luck, seriously, like, this is like how obsessed I am. Like I literally, if someone signs up to the website, I get a notification. I see who it is. If it's an intriguing person, you know, from a big company, I reach out immediately. I reach out to them on LinkedIn. I'll send them an email, but like that type of level of like obsession, most people don't have, they, they shut yeah. it off at three 30 and um, they miss opportunities. And these bigger companies, you know, they, they see that drive and that will and that work ethic, you know, that I put into this and they, they buy into it. So we got very lucky early on. Um, because we could not have done this without some of those big wins. Absolutely. So let's go back a little bit, because one of the things I find, you know, so fascinating is, you know, like I said, you know, owning an agency and dealing with some of those uh, marginalized services, social media, you know, email, um, you know, anything inbound, you know, you're reliant on, you know, to a degree, people coming to your site, finding you or searching for, you know, specific uh, keywords. Then on the other side, you have, uh, you know, the, all these uh, lead generation mechanisms, cold calls, uh, email scrapers, you know, whatever, you know, the the, the bottom kind of of the rung of, on those sorts of things in terms of uh, acquiring new qualified prospects. 
while you were in class, you know, as you mentioned, the professor threw out some crazy number about, you know, the, the open rate of a handwritten note. Um, what are you seeing, you know, in terms of actual effectiveness of, you know, what you're creating for campaigns for your clients and, you know, and in turn also for yourselves? So I, the best way people use Simply Noted is to attract and retain clients. So when I say attract, you know, a lot of people use this for like development, outbound, um, trying to book new meetings, just because the open rate's so high and it's so rare. The average person receives like three handwritten notes here. And I argue that most people receive zero. So when you get something in the, the mailbox, you just, you're so interested in who sent that. What's old is new again. Um, you know, people used to compete in the mailbox and it was a pain to open stuff and read it, but that's not the case nowadays. And people genuinely don't understand or don't think that handwritten notes can be scaled or automated. Um, and ours, like literally, like it's written with real pen, the ink smudges, like the natural way of a pen spits out ink. Like you can see it gets darker and lighter. So, I mean, it, lo it looks so authentic. It's so believable. And then the other way is to retain clients. So I, I purely at my heart and my core believe people should just use this as an appreciation tool. There's a Harvard Business uh, Review done by two really well-respected uh, professors at the university showing that, you know, by just giving them a better customer experience, how that's going to grow your business 25 to 95 percent year over year. Um, you know, people who feel appreciated are five times more likely to make a referral, five times more likely to forgive a mistake, um, seven times more likely to try a new product. Um, if you if they feel appreciated, um, you know, 66 percent of your, your clients who don't feel appreciated will try another competitor or competing product just because so like you're literally ha have the chance of losing two thirds of your clients every single year just because they don't feel loyal to you right. and they don't feel loyal because they don't feel appreciated so um attract and retain those are the two best ways to use this type of product but i purely like in my heart believe that this should be used as an appreciation tool because that's going to have compounding success for years to come versus you know a quick roi on a one mailing project yeah and, you know, so speaking of that to you, you know, how much of the process to simply noted handle, you know, so, you know, go to the website, ask for more information and, and they become your client, they start using your, your um, services. Do you handle mailing and envelopes and is it bulky mail? Like how, how, how involved or how many options are there? Yeah, we're completely vertically integrated, simply noted, um, from start to finish. From You can design your card on our website. Um, you can use AI, like OpenAI, to help you think of a message. Um, we're adding the ability to build lists, so you can like buy lists from our website. But right now, you have to provide us a list. And then everything's done here in-house. We have our own printing press, the same $200,000 printing press setup that you would see at a commercial printer. That's here. So as soon as your order gets sent in, it gets sent to our printing press and printed on the, the printing press it's cut and scored and then it gets sent through our handwriting robots. And then once it's sent through our handwriting robots, a real person hand quality controls it. So we visually make sure it looks great. We'll never let anything that looks bad get sent. They stuff it, they seal it and they put a real forever stamp on it with no simply noted branding. So if we're doing our job, which I think we do a really good job, um, nobody's ever going to know you use a service. It's going to look like it came from your desk. Yeah. That's awesome. And, um, you know, you mentioned AI and, and installing open AI. How has that changed your business over the last 18 months? So I don't know. You're on the East Coast. I don't know if you have in and out over there, but I, I, I feel like I, when you I get used to live on the West Coast. I, I, okay, so I'm, you know how in and out has like three things, right? You can get like a single, a double, you know, yeah. you can get like three things. On Animal the menu style. To make it simple. Yeah. Animal style. Yeah. Um, it's when you give people tons of options or they have to think about what to say for themselves, like the analysis paralysis just shuts them down. So, you know, now you literally can say like, let AI write it and just say, you know, write a thank you message um, to Justin for having me on the podcast. And literally it will write this perfect message and it's right there. And you don't even have to think about it. Like the grammar, it's perfect. You know, it reads well. And if you don't like it, you just hit retry, retry, retry until you see it and it's done. 
Um, and it's sad that we're getting there, but everything's going to be like that. It doesn't matter if you're ordering food or if like your diet needs to be automated or your handwritten notes need to be automated. You're not going to have to think about it. Like there's going to be AI integrations to all our emails. So we don't have to proofread it. It can automatically respond in your tone of voice. Like it's, that's where we're going. So we're just trying as the world's evolving, we're trying to evolve our product and, and integrate these tools that help you know, take the mental strain, decision fatigue, whatever it is off their plate yeah. and um, give them the tools to make it easy. Sure. Who are your best types of clients? Like who, who should be the, I mean, I know we're talking about appreciation and, and a lot of that comes from like business services and you're thinking, you know, we're talking about maybe one, one area, but um, you know, who are, you know, the perfect clients for something like this uh, that so, you, know, you see, yeah, that you see. Yeah, so for for retaining uh, current clients, so like where relationships matter, it's service based industries. So, real estate, mortgage, political, nonprofit, um, you know, where loyalty matters, right? Where the re you know they have choices. There's a lot of options. They're selling a product that's anybody can sell. Um, where you want to strengthen that relationship and increase the lifetime value, give them a better experience. I mean, then for like outbound, um, for uh, like acquiring new clients. <laughs> I mean, it's B2B, you know, businesses like SaaS companies, B2B, um, home service, uh, you know, roofing, solar windows, uh, car, uh, auto industry. So, I mean, the higher ticket item industries for sure. Um, but really, I, I think that's the, one of the challenging parts of growing this business. We haven't truly niched down as a company. We kind of service everybody which when you try to be everything to everyone, like it's really hard to scale. Like, and that's what we're trying to do now going into like in, at the end of year five, going into year six is start to like kind of niche down and really solve a specific problem for a specific group of people. But yeah, I would say, yeah, the service-based industries and then the high ticket item, you know, industries, um, yeah. are the ones who use us the most. All right. So going to ask then what's been the most like fun or cool or unexpected project that you've had where you're like, damn, man, that was, that was, uh, I, I didn't expect that. Or, or that was, that was something that really, I would, uh, I, I hate to say it. Like people use us for weird things. You know, I see people sending like, <laughs> like cards to prison. I, uh, you know, someone in prison, I see people sending breakup handwritten notes. Like it's been interesting to see what type of, you know, use cases people use this for, but, um, uh, the other, you know, the most exciting, fun, fulfilling part of this outside of growing a business and, you know, bringing the people, you know, our team along, you know, through the journey with us, been building these handwriting robots, just knowing that this technology, it, it, there's so much thought that's been put into it. It's going to outlive me. Uh, I truly believe that this project will be, or this product, this handwriting or handwriting engine and robot that we built will be global. Um, you know, I have aspirations to sell simply note in the next two or three years um, and go on to something else, but this handwriting technology will be all over the world. Um, I'm very proud of it. Yeah. So what's next for you? You mentioned, you know, potentially selling, you know, it may not be, a great time to sell in the next few years, depending on how uh, the economy goes, et cetera. But, you know, what are some of the like uh, exciting things that you're looking for that you're doing today that will have impact before you exit? I mean, that's the last thing on my list, really, um, that I've wanted to do with this company. For, I started this company um, because I was excited. Um, I wanted to prove to myself I can build a business. Um, I'm the I wanted to hit the Inc. 5000, which is, a, you know, a, a certain amount of revenue, private funded. Um, mm -hmm. Your company has to be three years old. We're hitting that this year. Um, just hit the 40 under 40 for the business journal. And I mean, we just got that award. And I never thought that was ever going to be a thing. So that was really cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying now, you know, I'm reading. I mean, the book I'm reading right now is Traction. I don't know if you can see this. It's like yep. literally like how to like get your business running without you how to build systems and operating procedures so that's my goal like next three years is like not necessarily go crazy and scale it beyond belief because as you're a physical product company that's capital extensive and technology extensive to scale to like 50 million dollars which i think this could be a like a high eight figure low nine figure company with you know the right sales channels um i can't do that without funding so um i'm trying the next three years to position this to sell or get an investor to help us sell or get to those types of revenue levels. Because 
I mean, we're going to need like a 40,000 square foot facility, you know, yeah. tons of capital, tons of machines, you know, payroll. And I have to be able to, to weather some, some storms because every business has storms and being self-funded, you mitigate risk by keeping costs low. <laughs> so that's what <laughs> we've done to stay afloat the last five years. Right. But you've had to, you know, also at a cost, right? Like, cause you've put in seven days a week, you've, you know, had to do yeah. more stuff. Yeah. And that's like why, like, I want to get help because I was like, I I have to stop managing all of our marketing. I have to bring people and like at some point, right. You get spread too thin, right. You can only give so much to everything. And it's like, I'm doing this company a disservice trying to do everything. And, um, but that's on purpose. Like, you know, executive level talent is going to cost, you know, high six figure, you know, salaries or equity, you know? So yeah, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, interesting you know, rope to walk you know, or or path to walk and figure out. What has it been like when, you know, you, you come from a interesting background, you played the NFL, you've, you've had, you know, friends all over the world that have gone on to other successes. You know, what is that like now when you go networking? Because, you know, to some degree you can tap into, you know, friends that you've had as you all uh, grew up. Uh, on the other hand, you also have to start from scratch. What has that been like in the conversations, you know, at, at you know, today when when you get together with old teammates and old friends? Well, I mean, I'm 35 now. I just turned 35. And I mean, 10 years ago when I got into the business world, I was like probably everybody who gets into the business world just unsure, you know, not confident because you don't really know how everything works. But um I think that's one of the best things about being becoming an entrepreneur. The ones who, you know, you either sink or swim, right? 80% of businesses fail within the first five years. I think like 95 fail within the first 10 years. And the ones who can make it work are the ones that won't accept failure and will just constantly pursue their problems until they figure them out. And that's what I love doing. I obsess about problems until I figure out, I I think about them all the time. Um, I've been, become a great person at at online marketing, SEO, managing ads, building a company, managing projects, all these like transferable skills I'll be able to use for anything that I do. And it's given me tons of confidence as a professional, as a person. Um, And it's like the David Goggins thing. I just keep adding these things to my cookie jar. You know, I've done (laughs) Ironmans, I've climbed mountains, I've been in the NFL, you know, I was an all pack 10, you know, you know, I've done all these things. I've built a business. I've built a technology. So I've just, it helps build this confidence. And I think as you become more mature in your, your career and you start learning more things, you start realizing how much you don't know and how thankful you are that you're there because you know how hard it is and you kind of want to help and give back because that's actually one of my passions. I want to start a podcast to help young entrepreneurs and athletes transitioning from sport to life because I know how hard it is and it is brutal. It chews you up. It eats you up. um, It beats you to your knees. Like it, it literally does. And I've seen it do it to a lot of people. So um, I'm just thankful that I've been able to not become part of that statistic or, you know, businesses fail. Um, but I'm telling you, the only way that it works, it, it's just massive, a massive amount of dedication, discipline and hard work. Um, like there's no such thing as a life, like a lifestyle company or, or work life balance as an entrepreneur in the first three to five years. Like you literally like unless like you're just trying to replace your income. But I, I, I'm right. trying to build a, a company that's going to, you know, change the lives of everybody who's come along with me. And if your dreams are that big that you want to take care of, you know, that core group of people that's helped you get it off the ground, it's not a lifestyle. It's not, it's it, don't no. listen to those social media gurus. Like it, it literally drives me nuts. Like I have one of my, one of my early whale clients, actually, he, um he just got bought out by private equity. And it's just so funny. Like I see what he says to people on, um, on social media, what to do. It's like, Oh, pay your vendors more, pay your, your, your employees more, um, charge more. And then I see what he does in his business. Like he's constantly beating the competition on price. He's using VAs. So he's not even paying people from the U S and then he literally goes against what he says about vendors. Like he'll take your price and position it. Hey, this guy will do it cheaper. (laughs) So it's like these social media guys are basically being hypocrites. They're doing the exact opposite or they're just, renting a car or they're just going to a friend's house who's night who has a nice house to try to build up this image so i think that's the hard thing about like becoming an entrepreneur nowadays it's like people make it look easy 
It is it's not. not. No, it is I, not. And I, and I, I, I feel like like those people need to be like literally banned or like <laughs> there needs to be like a disclaimer <laughs> or something. Cause like you're literally you're you're causing mental health problems for people. You think these people think they suck, they're failures, they're stupid, they're dumb, whatever. It's easy for them. Why isn't it easy for me? And it causes a lot of problems. And um I'm actually like it really it really really makes me mad because like this guy, like he's telling people he has a large audience. Um, but he's doing the exact opposite, you know, so yeah. he's only damaging them, but he's monetizing his following by saying something yeah. different. So it, it like, it literally makes me so mad. Like I want to rip my skin off, um, thinking about it. Cause it's just, it's so unfortunate that, you know, some people think that's true. Well, you make, so there's a lot to unpack there, but it, you know, really one of the things that, that I find really, uh, most powerful about what you said is, uh, a lot of drug, you know, as a former athlete myself, I'm a couple years older than you. I played Division One football as well, but didn't make it as as far. It, you know, once you are done re- being required to go to the gym every, you know, morning at five a.m. to go lift, uh, go do those extra runs at night. You know, a lot of athletes don't know what to do because life has been structured, you know, for so long. So they latch on to those sorts of social, uh, you know, gurus or experts that seemingly have it figured out and, and it's not real. And so all of a sudden they don't, and they didn't have the, you know, the foresight to either, you know, get a degree that mattered. um, And so that skill that they thought that they were, uh, acquiring doesn't pay nearly what they, you know, had, uh, had thought about or thought it could, um, or it's nowhere near what a potential athlete's salary is, you know? And, and so that glamor is, is instantly gone either because they graduated, uh, they got hurt in college and now, you know, are looking for something else. And, and you're right, there is a significant, uh, mental health, uh, issue there. And it's, you know, thinking, you know, again, at our age, um facebook was just in its infancy so you know what we had to go work hard um to figure things out there wasn't somebody to quote follow uh so you know it is an interesting time right now where there are so many places to 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 get information from well yeah i could talk to you for three hours about this and this is i mean i'm incredibly (laughs) passionate about this um what most people don't realize is if you if you self-educate and you try really hard making money is it's predictable um in terms of when you're stacking knowledge and you're creating systems and you're bringing the right people together you can make way more money than you'll ever make as a professional athlete i think my first my first contract um i was drafted to green bay in 2011 like the base salary was like four hundred thousand dollars and that's pre-tax that's pre-agent that's pre-everything i think it was like $200,000, like after you take everything out, like $180,000. And um, now it's a lot more, but um, you know, you can go make $180,000 in medical sales. You can make $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 in a good sales job. Um, You know, 10 years into your career, right? It took you how many years to get to the NFL? 15 years, 20 years, right? Like think about it. Now, if you do that same type of progress, which sucks, you start over, but now you're acquiring new skills by the time you get out of college, 21, 22, and they have all these different opportunities that we never had, right? They have NIL, name, image, and likeness. They can monetize their brand. They can use social media. They have these tools we didn't have, but creating that net worth or creating that value and creating that income is so much easier now. And that's like, I mean, I, I literally, I thought it was like, life or death make make the nfl or i'm going to be a failure and die and like i'm not going to make it i have no backup plans i don't come from money my parents don't have companies they can give me like i'm going to make forty thousand dollars a year and never be able to take it you know but that's the that's the mindset yeah. most athletes have it's like i have to make it or i'm not going to do anything right so um that's why it's important to have positive influences right and that's when i see these influencers who are lying you're only doing a disservice but yeah i'm really passionate about that like that's like one of my bigger picture things is starting a podcast and helping you know people get started and make them understand there is a way to do this and you can do it you can you can defeat you know failure and you can overcome it and Like the life you want to live is there, but you got to create it and it takes work and it's hard. The sleepless nights are, are real. The doubt is real. The anxiety is real. The stress is real, but 
the way I look at it is like responsibility and having um, the, uh, the pressure is a privilege because you, what you're doing is creating an opportunity to take care of those around you. And I like that responsibility. I like knowing that what I do can positively affect the people around me. Some people aren't like that. They just want to take care of themselves and be by themselves. But athletes, they're used to being around a team. They're used to being on a team. Um, yep. They're used to competing at a high level. And you kind of get a lot of those same feelings, you know, as an entrepreneur, like you're on a team, you're taking care of a team. We all got to work together. When one person's having a down month, the other person's got to take care of it and step up. Um, you're creating a culture and yeah, you know it, the yeah. culture that you're used to and the, yeah i mean and and i get that i think i think that's awesome uh i, I think yeah. you're on to something there not just with you know the business but also your your passionate your passion endeavors too I yeah think. that's my calling i mean i think you know simply noted was my proof to myself i can do something but i think that's where i mean that's where i want to go if you know i have young kids and i have a five and three year old I know they're going to grow up and go through a lot of these same things. I want to help them have a positive influence and create a, a network of great people. And, and, and plus there's a lot of great people to connect, connect out there like you and hear your story and hear about what you went through and your challenges, how you overcome it, what you're doing yeah. now, like, you know, the discipline, your structure, your routine, right? Like another thing is dealing with negative people. I didn't really realize like how bad like negative people were <laughs> until like, you know, I'm 35 now and I have a startup and I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, a wife, a family, your parents are getting older. And it's just like, I have all these other things that are mentally taxing that I'm trying to be the best version of myself for. And then I have all these, if I have a negative person in my life, that's just constantly negative. You just, that's a real thing. You have to push it away. And it's hard because yeah. sometimes they're really good friends, right? And you're just like, I feel bad. I want to be there for you, but I can't have an Eeyore that has a problem for every solution or, or okay. doesn't want to find a solution who just wants to be negative. Complain. So, yeah, I mean, I can keep, there's a lot of rabbit holes <laughs> I can go down this, in this direction, but um, I think at the, at the core of life and business, it's people, it's um, you got to have good people around you. You got to take care of your people. You got to look out for them. It's all transferable to business. If you do the same thing with your clients, you look out for them, you take care of them, you're trying to be better for them, your business is going to thrive. Yeah. And the people around you will thrive too, because, yeah. um, you know, they say the uh, um, a t rising tide lifts all boats. So, you know, Absolutely. if you're if you're that tied, then the boats, the boats come with you. Well, yeah. Rick, man, this has been uh, way more than I expected. And, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have had the opportunity to meet you, learn more about, you know, your story, learn about your technology, simply noted and where you're going. Really appreciate you being on the show today. Yeah, it was great. Thank you for allowing me to be on and, and to share my story. Was awesome. All right. I, I think there's a couple of these we might have to uh, dive into a little bit more down the road. So uh, I might, we'll have a follow up, a, fo <laughs> sounds, a follow up to this. Good. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> On behalf of Rick Elmore, the founder and CEO of Simply Noted, you've been listening to the Inspectations podcast powered by the Able Group. You have been listening to the Inspectations podcast. On behalf of your host, Justin Starbird, and our guests today, thank you for listening. To learn more about the Inspectations podcast, our guest, or the Abley Group, please visit us at www.ableygroup.com. Be sure to keep inspecting what you are expecting. <laughs>